Anyone can find a long laundry list of things that are kind of commonly being seen as things that one should do or take during cancer or to prevent the chance of having cancer or a recurrence. Vitamin D is a huge one. Yes, absolutely. What if we check your vitamin D and it's 15? This is not okay. Maybe some fatty fish like salmon or sardines, UV radiated mushrooms. How much water do you need to drink while receiving therapy or even ideally to reduce the chance of having cancer? We talk about all that here. Welcome to Target Cancer Podcast. My name is Dr. Sanjay Janesia. I'm a hematologist and medical oncologist, also known as the Onk Doc on social media. And today we have, and I always say this, but it is truly a special episode in the sense that it's unique. I have recruited two very knowledgeable individuals for one of the most common questions, truly, that I get on social media as well as in the comments and everything as it relates to cancer. And that is on herbal supplementation, dietary supplementation, and diets themselves when it relates to cancer, both during cancer, cancer treatments, and to optimize outcomes as well as survivorship to hopefully decrease recurrence rates. We talk about things like red meat and really what it does when it relates to inflammation, cancer therapies, which herbs and supplements to avoid that are dangerous that many people use unknowingly during uh, treatment, especially cancer treatment and chemotherapy, as well as some of the supplements that have shown to actually have a better outcome, uh, as well as diets, as opposed to either not having those supplements or not adhering to that diet as it relates to the chances of having a cancer cure, or at least having better tolerance with therapy and having better outcomes. So with that said, my two special guests, one is Dr. Crystal Zuniga, she is a PhD that earned her education through the University of Illinois and currently practices in UT Austin. She also has a private practice called Cancer Nutrition HQ, which is also her social media handle uh, on Instagram and TikTok and really where I found her. And I've actually learned quite a bit of details that I share with my own cancer patients in my clinic. The other is Laura Kearns. She is a clinical dietitian that received her education at Tulane and currently practices at Oxner in Louisiana. Laura Kearns is actually someone that I heard the keynote talk of. We were both doing a keynote at the Louisiana Oncology Society annual meeting, and my mind was blown with the things that I learned when it relates to uh, mushrooms and use during cancer therapy, turkey tail, and several of those other things where she gets very granular about what supplements have evidence, how you should take them, and which ones are important to avoid. With all that said, the first thing that I teed up for both of them was basically this concept on does what you eat have an effect or outcome with a cancer diagnosis as well as with its treatment? I still don't feel like I'm an expert because I'm constantly learning, constantly getting more questions I don't necessarily know the answer to, having to dig into the research, talk to other people, you know. And so I'm fortunate that I've had a lot of great mentors and I work with a lot of people who know things that I don't and vice versa. And we, you know, bounce ideas off of each other. So, yes, I mean, if I'm talking to a breast cancer patient, we're definitely talking about something completely different than prostate cancer. You know, if I'm talking... (laughs) about somebody, you know, on immunotherapy, we're not talking about the same thing as chemotherapy. Just like you said, it's it's talking to people about, yes, in this setting, that is a great option. You know, what you read on your, you know, Facebook group or your support group or heard in this, you know, whatever setting is true in this circumstance, but in the circumstance you're in right now, this is what we need to do. And so, yes, it gets extremely specific which is what makes it so complicated. (laughs) Nutrition definitely matters. Um, And because that is a message that you can then relay to your patients and discuss because there actually has been some research on uh, patients wishing that their providers had brought up the discussions about nutrition and exercise and thinking that they're not getting this information during treatment and they have lots of questions. Um, And so Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of resources for that information. Uh, I am a board certified uh, di- board certified in oncology uh, as an oncology dietitian, and there was a recent survey actually done that showed that there was in the U.S. one dietitian for every twenty three hundred uh, cancer cases um, when they surveyed cancer centers across 
the U.S. And that was just the cancer centers that were surveyed. So if you really surveyed all of them, I don't think we actually had that good of a ratio. Another point of discussion was what are the things that actually may be helpful in some cases and not necessarily helpful in others? We basically talked about the importance of please appreciating and understanding that every situation is unique both from the underlying problems that the individual has that has the diagnosis, as well as the cancer type. And then finally, what treatment you're getting and how these circumstances may play a difference in what diet, herb, or supplement is either beneficial or harmful. I would say um, one is mushrooms and mushroom supplements. So uh, turkey tail, for instance, is something I get asked a lot about. You probably get asked a lot about. Um, it's been used in Asia for decades as actually an adjunct to traditional treatments. And so there's actually a lot of data out there about it. But in terms of in more Western cultures, trying to incorporate it into our treatment regimens has been very difficult. And so I usually tell people, especially actually on immunotherapy, we are pulling back, I think, in general on turkey tail use because of it. Um, it basically increases that immune function. And so we don't want to, you know, contraindicate what we're doing with immunotherapy by throwing in another immune stimulator. And so that's super interesting because all the previous studies have always been chemotherapy. So what happens that with immunotherapy, I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows yet. Uh, so that's an interesting one. And I would say I don't necessarily recommend it with chemotherapy either because, you know, we don't have great supplements. You know, the U- the FDA doesn't rec- regulate supplements in the U.S. And so they're extremely cautious about brands and dosing and what's actually going to work and, you know, not cause a greater problem. And so a lot of those things like turkey tail, I might use it in the survivorship setting where we're off of chemotherapy, we're off of immunotherapy, you know, trying to rebuild the immune system now, trying to recover. Um, same thing with something like lion's mane, another mushroom. Um, it could be very good for memory and cognition. So when you have that chemo brain post-treatment, that might be another time to to use that. So I definitely like to focus on um what are things that are going to support the immune system? As we were talking about, the immune system's always on surveillance for these types of things. And adequate protein in the diet. Our protein is the building blocks of our cells and of antibodies. So we're getting adequate protein from the diet, um, which is especially challenging for those going through cancer treatment. That's usually not when people are craving tofu or chicken breast. It's when they're going through cancer treatment. It, so it's even more challenging. Uh, to get adequate protein. But then we also have to look at getting adequate vitamins and minerals like vitamin C right, and zinc and vitamin D. And I think the problem is that people are looking for sometimes just this one, what's the one supplement I can take that's going to support my immune function? Right, that It's more complex than that. Right. And we want to look at the dietary pattern that is supporting your immune system. Think about diversity of our diet. One, we're going to help support a diverse microbiome. But also that means that you're going to be exposing yourself to the variety of vitamins and minerals that are in food. What's in broccoli is not what's in carrots and not what's in apples. As you consume more diverse food sources, you're also going to be able to meet those vitamin and mineral needs. What vitamin C does is not what zinc does. So we need zinc and we need vitamin C and we need all these other vitamins and minerals. They can't replace each other's functions. And so as um, rather than go into all different vitamins and minerals just to understand that each one of them we have different needs for and we're not going to get it all from one food and we're not going to get it all from one supplement we pardon this interruption real quick if you're enjoying this podcast or find it valuable for what we discuss and the education and how people see and think about cancer in general we would very much appreciate a like subscribe and especially a share so we can bring that information as maximally and broadly as possible thank you so much for listening Many people have their opinion when it relates to what herb or supplement uh, may have a positive effect or a favorable effect when it relates to cancer or cancer prevention. Next, I asked, what are some of the things that you can say pretty much for sure that you do recommend when it relates to having cancer or cancer treatment or preventing it, as well as what are the things that maybe are more nuanced? Vitamin D is a huge one. Yes, absolutely. So I think we're learning and I think COVID actually propelled this research more forward is that vitamin D does a lot more than just bone health, right? And there seems to be a lot of immune um, 
functions behind it. And for some reason, you know, people that have better vitamin D status might respond better to chemotherapy and people who have a better vitamin D status might um, have less recurrences and maybe even less cancers in general. Just like we saw people with better vitamin D status did um, tended to do better with COVID when they were diagnosed with COVID. So I am very comfortable, you know, I ask all the time, I'm like, please check a vitamin D, please check a vitamin D. They haven't had one in and so long. And, you know, we try to optimize it right away. You know, 30 is like the cutoff for normal, right? But that's not really optimal. So we're trying to get above at least 40, if not 50 to 60 in that range. So you wanted to use D3. That's your active form of vitamin D. Um, I like to get the lab checked and not just guess. And I tell the patients that too. I'm like, look, I can tell you to go grab a random vitamin D supplement off the shelf that's got a thousand IUs, going to meet your daily need. But I don't know if that's what you need. What if we check your vitamin D and it's 15? You know, I had that the other day. It came back 15. I'm like, this is not okay. So, you know, we had to start with 50,000, not 1,000. And so there's a big difference there. Yeah, so dietary supplement use, actually, again, some research showing that dietary supplement use higher in cancer survivors than the general population for exactly you know, that reason, thinking that a supplement might help with their response to treatment. Um, and unfortunately, there's really limited research on this. And in fact, there are some concerns of could some supplements make things worse? Could they interact with the effectiveness of their treatments and their therapies that they're on? Um, there's unfortunately, like I said, not a lot of great research on some dietary supplements. You, know, you might hear things like, I know, turmeric a really popular one, um, vitamin C supplements, people taking probiotics. And they're not all the same. Like we can't group all supplements into one. I would say like your short answer there is no, there is not one individual supplement that we know is going to have uh, a significant impact on outcome. Yeah. But I will say that there is definitely growing research on how they might be able to support someone's um, outcomes. For example, some new research coming out about vitamin D and being vitamin D deficient might have a negative impact on outcomes. Um, some research coming out about probiotic supplementation might actually help reduce the severity of chemo-induced diarrhea. So there's a time and a place for supplements, but one place is not for the replacement of therapies. Anyone can find a long laundry list of things that are kind of commonly being seen as things that one should do or take during cancer or to prevent the chance of having cancer or a recurrence. Some of those things include turmeric, vitamin D, and metformin. This is some of the information I was able to unpack from qualified dietitian and nutrition insights when it relates to the academic literature. Um, fish oil is one that I think is really exciting. It's fairly similar, you know, potentially improved treatment responses is a big piece of it. Um, it decreases inflammation. It can help with, um, you know, maintaining more of the lean muscle tissue, which is, you know, really important for drug metabolism, um, preventing, you know, things like malnutrition. You know, I don't think it's definitive to know for sure, you know, absolutely, if you take fish oil, it's this huge advantage. We don't know that for sure. But there's a, there's a lot of really interesting data, um, and if, you know, somebody doesn't necessarily want to take that or maybe their platelet counts are too low to recommend something that could potentially act as a blood thinner, then we go to, okay, what fatty fish do you like? Can you eat it two, three times a week? Try to get kind of the same level of those omega-3s going. The omega-3s um, can, you know, potentially have a blood thinning effect. And so right. if platelets are dropping below about 150, that's when we don't want to be using those as a supplemental form. Um, safe to eat it always in the fish form, but in terms of supplementation, that's when I would not want to use it. So when we talk about Very interesting. Being super granular, like I have to pull up somebody's CBC when I'm talking to them and I'm like, oh no, your platelets aren't high enough or your platelets are trending down. We can't do this right now. So let's stick with the fish and avoid the fish oil for now. I do have some people who are using uh, different forms of ginseng to try to increase their energy levels. And that's another potential anticoagulant, um, you know, supplement. And so that's another one you'd have to be cautious with. Um, you also have to be cautious with the Asian or Chinese ginseng as it's known, you know, more popularly as um, there's all these different forms and they're not the same plant. And <laughs> the Asian or Chinese ginseng um, 
can increase estrogen. And so if you're an estrogen positive breast cancer patient, we've got to avoid it. One of my first fields uh, I recommend to almost all of my patients is know your vitamin D levels. I think that's a really easy test to have run. And you can ask your provider about this. There's been some research that almost half of our U.S. population is vitamin D insufficient. Uh, so we're also approaching wintertime here. That can even be another challenge for people to get their vitamin D. It's not very abundant in the diet. When we think of our sources of vitamin D, maybe some fatty fish like salmon or sardines, uh, UV radiated mushroom, fortified milk. So not a whole lot of sources, right? So if you're not doing that, it's kind of hard to are getting that synthesis from the sun is another way that we can get vitamin D. But also we've been promoting in public health for people to be wearing sunscreen to protect their uh, from UV radiation. So that also does reduce the amount of vitamin D that can be synthesized from our skin. So all that together is like, first we need to know, because if you're deficient, then you might actually need some higher levels to get you back up to just normal, right? So we want to get personalized how much you need. Um, and as far as the mechanism, you know, vitamin D is actually functioning once it gets activated. So we, whether we're getting that vitamin D synthesized from our skin or getting it from food or getting it from a supplement, it's not active yet. Um, it has to be activated in the liver and the kidney before we have a functional vitamin D that's doing its job. And it's functioning like a hormone. Right? So it can bind to receptor, vitamin D receptors, and then that's regulating things like um, our DNA, what genes are going to be synthesized, right? What oh, proteins wow. are going to be made. So it's turning signaling on and off. I mean, there's been a lot of research on vitamin D and its role beyond bone health. I think a lot of people know about vitamin D and bone health, but not so much understanding that vitamin D is doing more than just um, helping with calcium absorption for bone health. It's important to realize that the diet actually means kind of in a whole sense what is being consumed over a period of time. It's not necessarily a singular thing like omega-3s or fish or vitamin D, but really what are the things that you should try in general to do and to avoid? Some of the things that we discuss next relate to both the diet as well as what the proteins and fats and kind of conscientiousness about the components of the calories or what makes up those calories uh, are, what is being consumed, but as well as how important protein fats, and other sources are when it relates to muscle health and overall wellness and kind of durability of treatments. My approach that I take most of the time is that we have seen over and over and over that plant-based diets and people who follow plant-based diets do the best. Um, you know, better outcomes, better health in general. Um, but what that means in terms of controlling insulin levels is yes, you have to balance what you're taking in, right? So you're using oil, you know, avocados, nuts, seeds, all these healthy fats, um, along with maybe plant-based carbohydrates like beans and other legumes. Um, and I think, you know, the reason that that plant-based diet works, even though it might have more carbohydrates from healthy sources, complex carbohydrates, is the fiber. So I'm a huge proponent of gut health and how you're and how the health of your gut relates to the immune system. And I think with immunotherapies, we're actually seeing that that's extremely important. Um, having a healthy gut and a healthy gut flora, you know, can, there's actually studies coming out showing it does improve response to treatment. And there's ones um, just about like fiber supplements. There's ones um, looking specifically at a Mediterranean diet and adherence to the Mediterranean diet and um, doing better on immune checkpoint inhibitors. And yeah, there's like, it's all very, very new. It's all in the last couple of years. And so to me, that fiber is so important. So we have to be eating a lot of fruits, a lot of vegetables, like I said, nuts and legumes, all that. So it's not necessarily a low carbohydrate diet. It's a complex carbohydrate diet and it's balanced with the protein and the fat, you know, to keep the glycemic load of each, you know, meal down. Absolutely. Even though I'm going to recommend plant-based for almost everybody, we get a little more into the weeds, you know, based on, yeah, exactly what's your cancer type, what are the symptoms you're having from your cancer treatment, and exactly what are, what's your inflammation look like, et cetera. Um, yeah. There are, again, some more like nuanced things where um, prostate cancer, uh, there's been some studies showing 
that potentially eggs, particularly the yolk of the egg, um, could lead to more aggressive prostate cancers. We don't know once they already have prostate cancer what that effect is, you know, but maybe if prostate cancer is something that runs rampant in the family, that could be something that you want to pull back on, you know, when you're younger um, so that, you know, that's one less risk factor. So, you know, these are all, when we talk about like uh, a lot of stuff with nutrition and integrative medicine in this space, it's all evidence informed. This is not evidence based and there's a difference, right? I can't do a double blind placebo control trial on an egg and an, an egg yolk, right. right? And so we're we're just providing the best information we can with what we with what we currently have. And so I tell them, I'm like, you know, if you're really interested in your diet, here's what we know and here's what we don't know. We know it could lead to more aggressive prostate cancers based on you know if two or three studies. Not every single study shows that relationship, and we don't know once you have prostate cancer what the risk you know, is. We use the terms nutrition and, and health, right? Like is the patient have a good nutritional status or not, but there's actually some granular ways to be able to talk about the nutritional status. Some of those things have to do with weight as well as weight loss. What is the percentage of weight that's being uh, compromised or signaling that something may be under duress, but there's also lab markers like albumin, uh, pre-albumin, ESR and CRP, both which have to do with inflammation. And these things, believe it or not, are actually used to help tailor both goals as well as interventions and adaptations during care when you're visiting with a nutritionist or dietitian. These are the things that have to be said when it relates to both inflammation as well as some of those metrics for overall nutritional status and how they affect cancer outcomes. Yeah, I think the the only thing specific to cancer potentially is the inflammatory effects. And so, you know, how I talked about, you know, is one of the reasons that fish oil potentially helps during treatment with treatment responses is the decreased inflammatory responses. You know, can are we getting a better outcome because of that? Are we getting better, you know, muscle tone? Are we getting, you know, all those things? So possibly that, I don't know that we know for sure when it comes to the fats, you know, what the, what that benefit is other than your general health too. Yeah. I think that's great with the edema. Patients can see that. And sometimes that can mask the weight loss because there's so much fluid retention. Uh, so it masks the weight loss, but something else we look for um, within the dietitian scope is doing a nutrition focused physical exam where we're feeling for muscle and fat loss in some specific areas. So if there is severe, um, muscle wasting or fat loss, we can also use that as criteria for diagnosis of malnutrition. Um, so to understand that that can often be, people think that malnutrition is what often people associate with the body type of anorexia, right? A very you know, emaciated individual, that's a very severe case of a particular type of malnutrition. Individuals with overweight and obesity can also have malnutrition. That malnutrition, as I talked about those criteria, is not like so, some BMI category. No, it's about changes in intake, changes in weight, changes in muscle, fat, functional status. Those are measures of malnutrition. So I think what's often concerning is that because of we know this higher rate of overweight and obesity in our population, that malnutrition gets missed. And people think that the weight loss is a good thing. There I've heard that point. directly from patients saying, I've been trying to lose this weight. And I remind them, cancer is not a weight loss plan. You do not want to be losing this weight so quickly with inflammation because what you're losing is muscle. Okay. And as you mentioned that there is research on muscle mass being associated with survival outcomes. And so if someone's losing weight quickly, that weight is not typically coming from fat. It's coming from muscle. What are the supplements that more or less seem to have a significant effect on how someone is able to tolerate their cancer therapy and get through their therapy? Is it omegas? Is it vitamin D? Is it turmeric? Or is it even some agents like metformin or other kind of medically prescribed prescriptions that aren't necessarily anti-cancer? The fatty fish are probably going to be my first go-to. So, okay. you know, like salmon, for instance, being an excellent source of omega-3s. Um, okay. That's one of the things we know affects inflammation the most um, and can, you know, bring it down fairly quickly. Um, I can kind of tell you a, a side note with that. I um, 
I've had some physicians reach out because they're trying to get a patient, say, on a clinical trial, but their albumin is too low. And so they're like, they need more protein, they need more protein. I'm like, is it that or do they have too much inflammation? <laughs> so, you oh, know, I might be talking to that. Yes, exactly. So a lot of times it's not the protein, it's the inflammation. So I had one patient I will recall in particular that um, I didn't feel that they were particularly, you know, protein deficient in their diet. We did talk about the protein a lot and make sure they were, you know, optimizing it. And I think we added um, a little bit extra protein, but we talked about their inflammatory load and, you know, everything they were going through. And um, we added a fish oil supplement. I made sure that was fine with like the trial, you know, they weren't on yet, but I was like, look, if I start this, is that okay? And they're like, whatever it takes, you know, to get on trial eligible. So we added the fish oil, we worked on the protein and, you know, two weeks later they were in a spot where they could, you know, actually get on trial. So yes, I would say the fish, the vitamin D, fiber, preferably from fruits, vegetables, complex carbohydrates, um, water, which is something we didn't talk about. Finally, I got an opportunity to ask one of the questions that I really never had a good answer to, and I'm kind of embarrassed. And that's how much water do you need to drink while receiving therapy, or even ideally to reduce the chance of having cancer. There is a quantified amount and surprise or surprise not, it's actually not fully uniform for everybody. It's dependent on whether you're actually getting chemotherapy and not, as well as a couple of other factors. So let's hear it. How much water do we need? Yeah, I'm not, I'm sitting here. I'm not doing a lot. I need about 25 milliliters per kilogram of body weight. Um, Somebody who's on a cisplatin chemotherapy, uh, which is, you know, very dehydrating. You know, it's really toxic to the kidneys, for instance. We need them to drink 35 mils per kilogram. And so someone who's 6'3 and 220 needs a lot more water than someone who's 5'1 and 110. You know, so it's very much, we can't give everyone the same recommendation. I see it all the time. Two to three liters every day. I'm like, well... This person and this person are nowhere near the same size. That doesn't work for everybody. On this podcast, we've talked a lot about ketosis and, you know, decreased sugar. How does that re- relate to modern, traditional dietitian and nutritionist recommended literature and pathways when it comes to cancer treatment? Are they recommended or are there other kind of diets that they recommend on utilizing during the cancer treatment process? How hard are these recommendations and what is the literature support? So if you take, you know, decades of research on on this topic and put it together, it, it seems to be, you know, like I said, people are healthier, they do well on treatment, they do well post-treatment, et cetera. And I think initially, to your point, people thought it was because of the antioxidants. So you eat a lot of dark colored fruits and vegetables, you get a lot of antioxidants, you know, that, you know, supporting your immune system, that's why you're doing better. But I think it's more than that, right? There was a, um, I forget the name, and I'm sorry that I forgot the name of the paper, but it was um, published out of Sloan Kettering like a year, it might be two years now that we're getting into 2024, but uh, it was excellent. It had this image of all the different things that a plant-based diet does when it's inside your, you know, when you're following it, what's happening to your body. And then right next to it was a ketogenic diet, which comes up a lot when we're talking about cancer treatment, because we're talking about well, maybe if we lower the glucose, lower insulin levels, you know, et cetera, like you mentioned, maybe that's the key, right? There's been so much looked into with the ketogenic diet with cancer. So it put the plant-based diet next to the ketogenic diet and compared them. And the plant-based diet, with the exception of one factor, was doing everything that the ketogenic diet did, plus a whole lot more. So you were getting all the benefits of the keto diet minus the one, plus an extra, you know, five, six, seven, however many it was on the image. So it's a great, it's a great image. And I actually show it to patients sometimes, the ones that are like really into research and like they really want to like see the data. Like I'll pull it up on my screen and show them like, look, here's keto, here's plant-based. Isn't this interesting? And they're like, wow, that really is. There's a lot of nuances, I would say, when you, when you have the ketogenic diet where you have to be so careful, you know? Um, And so with the when you're going plant-based and, you know, I don't love the term plant-based because what does that even mean anymore? Right. Does that mean mean? vegan? Does that mean vegetarian? And I don't even know that this, 
you know, when you take all these different studies, it, it doesn't make a clear, you know, picture, but it, to me, plant-based is people who are eating more than five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, ideally seven to 10, um, you know, really eating maybe more fish and chicken, less red meat. I tell people like, I don't need you to be a vegan necessarily, but, you know, maybe only eat meat or animal products once a day. So if you like having your chicken or whatever it is at dinner with your family, like great. And then the rest of the day, like let's do plant, you know, let's find yeah. it's like focus your diet. So to me, it's like a 70 to 80% plant diet. Sugar can feed a cancer cell. Glucose is a really rapid fuel source for those cancer cells, but that is not the only cell in the body using that glucose. And even if you don't eat it, your body is going to be able to make glucose because we need glucose to survive. Um, those red blood cells cannot use any other fuel source other than that glucose molecule. So um, yes, we don't want to be promoting the with that I say, okay, here's where they're getting that from. Like, yes, we do know that cancer cells utilize glucose at a rapid rate. They're rapidly dividing. Um, but what we can focus on, though, is what are some ways to help manage your blood glucose levels? Because we don't want high blood glucose levels. We know that that also has negative impacts on the body. And so I, I really like to try to find that as an opportunity to talk about what can we be using with your diet quality to try to manage your blood glucose levels. And that does not mean that we have to cut out any source of carbs in your diet. So and yes, I know you've had some speakers or some guests here talk about their research, ongoing research about the ketogenic diet and where that might be therapeutic. But again, back to our earlier conversation about how that really needs to be individualized when we talk about our dietary approaches. Is that safe for this person? Is that actually been researched in this particular cancer type? Um, and if that's something they want to pursue to make sure that that's done safely and under the guidance with their providers. But there's so much ongoing research and there's a lot of nuance. Yes, some cancer types like particular amino acids. There's a research of how some cancer cells steal glucose from immune cells. Like They're getting the fuel that they need regardless of what you eat, Yeah, right, unfortunately. And that's scary to think about. But then I also think, but your body is trying its best to get rid of this thing. And the therapy is working at trying to get rid of this thing. So what can we do with your diet to best support your body in, in getting through this? And sometimes really restrictive diets are going to make that a lot more difficult to give your body the full you know, nutritional profile that it needs. So one of the things that you cannot avoid and has to be talked about when it comes to diet and nutrition in cancer is the gut microbiome. What does this mean? And why is the gut microbiome important, both when you're receiving therapy or if you're having to have therapy in the future? So prebiotics is what, uh, you know, fiber is a type of prebiotic. I mean, you look at our American Institute for Cancer Research, cancer prevention recommendations are promoting that high fiber diet, right? getting whole grains, fruits, vegetables, beans, legumes, uh, because one of the reasons why are is that they're good sources of fiber. And we're learning more that fiber is not just about bowel regularity. Many people are aware of that mechanism, but that there are certain types of fibers that act like prebiotics. So we can't digest those fibers, but our gut bacteria love them for fuel. And the more diverse our sources of prebiotics, we're supporting a more diverse and abundant microbiome. And that's really what we want to be promoting, a diverse and abundant amount of bacteria in our intestine. We talked about some of the mechanisms. Yes, it can support intestinal health, but also seeing research about how it supports immune function, right? And our immune system, I know you yeah. probably talked about this on the podcast, how our immune system has a role in how people respond to therapies. And the immune system is also trying to help out at this time too. So think about, there's a lot of probiotic drinks and supplements promoted out there. And I remind people that, like you were saying, there are trillions of bacteria and then what we're seeing in these probiotic supplements might be a dozen different strains. We have way more strains than that in our oh, gut wow. bacteria. Yeah. Right. So we want to make sure that we are feeding the ones that are in there, not just popping a pill and thinking that's going to promote our health. We've got to also feed them as well. Yeah. So don't, there's no shortcuts, unfortunately, when it comes to building a diverse and healthy microbiome that probiotic pills. Um, our supplements have a time and place that they can be utilized to be beneficial, but we want to think about it from the dietary approach of 
sources of probiotics to help feed those bacteria. So we've always heard that fiber, fiber, fiber decreases the chance of colorectal cancer. Now it's kind of a little debated. Is it really that magical when it relates to colorectal cancer specifically? However, we were able to uncover in these discussions why fiber is still extremely important for other reasons, as well as what is the benefit when it comes to fruits and vegetables and antioxidants, or is it something else about fruits and vegetables that makes cancer outcomes as well as the overall nutritional status very important as it relates to therapy and preventing cancer? We talk about all of that here. Fiber supplements are a little more difficult because they're definitely not all created equal. Um, there has been, you know, positive studies just with fiber supplements, though not even because, you know, if you're thinking about back to my whole thing about nutrition is difficult with this whole idea of like trying to do a double blind placebo controlled thing. If you take a fiber pill, that is one thing we could potentially do a more, you know, specific trial with, you know, you can give a placebo and you can give fiber. Um, so there have been some positive trials with just using fiber supplements. Yeah, definitely talk about that if you don't mind if I piggyback off what you're talking about with the immunotherapy. I think it's very exciting about the role of diet. So the research that has come out about um, fiber being associated with the microbiome and someone's response to immunotherapy. Yeah. And there have been several studies in melanoma looking at that. And when that research came out, you know, that's only a few years old, I was so excited about it, not because yes, we're we're showing the role of fiber, but that is just giving some insight into the impact of diet on outcomes, right? That it's not necessarily the fiber that improved the response to immunotherapy. It's fiber interacting with the microbiome, which interacts with the therapy. So it's really showing the complexity of how we can use diet to help promote outcomes. So I was really excited about that. And that research has shown fiber as well as um, a Mediterranean type diet being associated with better outcomes for immunotherapy. I think anyone can agree listening to this that if nothing else, it is very nuanced on what should and shouldn't be done when it relates to cancer. The The answer is just not clear. And the main reason is, one, there's a lot of confounding variables, right? Like it's really hard to isolate just one intervention. But two, it's also because there's a lot of variables that go into that recommendation from the treatment to the cancer type to the person themselves, as well as their genetics. What's most important is to think about the things that you shouldn't do or that you shouldn't use a lot of caution with, as well as what are some of the things generally deemed safe and probably a good idea without any strong evidence to say it's a bad idea. So I typically will use um, turmeric and curcumin in teas and cooking uh, because I feel those are safe ways to consume it. So, um, you know, some cultures you know, using like curries and things like that's very common. Yeah. Or making like golden milk, you know, something like that. Um, yeah, and, and teas are really common. I have a lot of tea drinkers and, you know, they might have like a turmeric blend tea, you know, those I feel a lot more comfortable with because just like other, um, you know, antioxidants and things, getting them from food is always a safe option. I saw one recently, you know, we talked about, um, you know, estrogenic herbs and things, uh, for some reason, I feel like some of these things make the rounds and then they disappear for a while and they re <laughs> they resurface. So um, there's a supplement that you can take called DIM, and I'd be lying if I can remember like the compound that DIM <laughs> stands for, but it's it's a compound found in cruciferous uh, vegetables. And so there's a lot out there about cruciferous vegetables and the benefits when it comes to cancer being one of them. Um, but, you know, so of course, the American way is to then stick it in a in a supplement, right? So if a little could a lot, it's got to be better, right? Or a oh, great way to get it. And so um, that is another one that could potentially um, increase estrogen levels, which I didn't realize at first. So it's been coming up a lot. And so it came up recently with a breast cancer patient. And when I lo went looking into it, I was like, okay, here's another one we got to have on the radar now. That was one. Um, I think you hit a lot of them. I get, I get asked a lot about mushrooms, um, a lot about turmeric or curcumin. Um, I would say those are the most common. What's interesting though, is I talk to a lot of people having a lot of GI problems post-treatment, and there are some safe things like fiber supplements and also enteric-coated peppermint that are excellent for GI symptoms. 
Um, and people are asking about those, which I think is interesting. So that's one that I try to bring more, you know, light to. How so? Like for in what way specifically? So I get a lot of um, people who might have had, let's say, pelvic radiation. We'll pick on that one. Okay, so really difficult on the gut, and it can be a long-term problem. And so they end up having almost like an IBS-like issue, you know, and so um, it might not be IBS specifically, but they benefit from a lot of the same strategies we would use for treating IBS. So changing some of the diet to match a more IBS-like diet using FODMAP. Um, but enteric-coated peppermint helps with the it has like an anti-inflammatory effect specifically on uh, the, in, the small intestines. And so you get this um, smooth muscle relaxation, less gas, less bloating, and it's a very, very safe uh, supplement. And so that's something that I use on treatment after treatment quite often. Yeah, I do like probiotics in certain circumstances, um, you know, like a, maybe a chemotherapy induced diarrhea, a lot of gut issues strictly from chemotherapy, say like 5-FU, you know, that's um, one that might cause it. But with immunotherapy, you know, we ha we run the risk if we're using, you know, specific strains of bacteria, like say lactobacillus or something like that. If we're introducing large amounts of just that one strain, we might be decreasing the gut diversity. And uh -huh. so immunotherapy... There's so a little bit of data. It's not, you know, super strong yet, but there is some to show that maybe that's not the best idea on immunotherapy. So potentially oh, helping wow. chemo and controlling some of those GI symptoms, not so good on immunotherapy. There were so many pearls and insights in our conversation that somehow was an hour, but felt like it was 20 minutes, if not 10, with Laura Kearns. Tune in to hear some of those additional details that I didn't even know I wanted to know. Chemo brain and the brain fog that happens after chemotherapy. I've heard that a lot that patients are like, yes, I, you know, got control of my disease and, and I'm in a remission, but nobody really helps me with the brain fog and possible chemo brain effects afterward. Laura, what is the one thing, or at least one of the things that may have evidence behind improving cognition and memory and chemo brain side effects? Yeah, I think one of the most exciting areas is with mushrooms and mushroom extracts, lion's mane being one that is known to help boost cognition and cognitive function. And so that's one that I will recommend um, post-treatment in the survivorship setting once we're off all the medications as a potential benefit. It's not something given you uh, during the treatment process with chemotherapy no, and stuff? Um, you know, th these things are so complicated with the, all the cytochrome P450 interactions and the possibility of interacting with treatment, that is one that does have that interaction. And so I tend to be a little more conservative during treatment. Others may differ in their, you know, thoughts on that in terms of timing with treatment. There might be a way around it, but I usually reserve it for the post-treatment setting. What about um, for neuropathy, right? We get a lot of that with oxaliplatin and yes. several of the chemo drugs. You hear B6 occasionally and some other things. I believe B6 is the correct one. Is yep. there any evidence, the number one question I guess being, is there evidence that anything helps for sure? And if so, or if not, what are some of the things that people do try to do to make it um, more tolerable? Yeah, I don't love the data on B12 and B6 for neuropathy. Like I understand, you know, the idea behind it and there's some, you know, there's some research out there, but it's not super compelling and there's a lot of negative trials too. So okay. I've never been like a huge fan of using those during treatment. Um, one that can potentially work is alpha lipoic acid. I haven't seen a lot of great studies with cancer neuropathy. So, you know, like oxaliplatin induced, you know, chemotherapy induced neuropathy, but there's a lot of good studies with, um, diabetic neuropathy. So that's where that comes from. Um, so that is one of the, you know, safer ones to use after treatment if they've got neuropathy. Um, I do use that. We use acupuncture at our facility a lot as a preventative, um, yeah. in addition to cryotherapy. So the gloves and the boots that are, you know, basically like ice packs that you put on your hands and feet. Uh, so we use that form as well. But um, yeah, the alpha lipoic acid, like I said, is the only one that has better data behind it. Dairy and red meat. And a lot of my younger patients, especially, I seem very concerned. They're like, I'm just hearing it is kerosene on a fire inflammatory 
what does the data show okay. on those two things? And is it something to really, you know, strongly consider? Yeah, I do think that red meat, you know, it's actually on the list of carcinogenic foods, right? You know, if you look at the World Health Organization, it's pretty liberal though. So if you look at the nuances, it's 16 ounces a week. So oh, that's, wow. that's a lot of red meat, but I do, you know, I talk to people that love red meat and it's like, I want a steak or a burger every day, right? So for some people that's easier to achieve than others. Um, I do think beyond cancer, it's better to back off even more than that, you know, maybe eight ounces a week or something to that effect. I have this really silly rhyme that my patients love and it, the less feet, the more you should eat. And so love that plants and fish don't have feet unless you want to get like really, really into the weeds on that. <laughs> and then, you know, things that poultry and eggs, you know, are coming from two legged animals. And then, you know, pork and beef and that kind of stuff is, you know, coming from four. And so that's one of my like silly rhymes that I tell them to help remember. I love that. But so dairy, but dairy itself, like milk and or eggs dish. and stuff, is that, is there data to suggest that that's in any way harmful? There is, you know, data on different things. And I think this is one that people tend to argue kind of a lot back and forth about. So um, dairy being one and eggs being the other. I feel like poor eggs, they're just like thrown one way, they're good, they're bad, they're good, they're bad, you know. But there is some data to show that, you know, eggs and um, dairy could be inflammatory. How much is one of the questions and who, is it the same for everyone is another question. So you mentioned precision medicine. Well, I'm trying to do precision precision nutrition, right? And so if I have someone who has a lot of inflammatory conditions, so we're getting outside of the cancer, but, you know, if they have, you know, say RA or they have um, maybe, you know, a pain condition like fibromyalgia, you know, things where they might be more sensitive to inflammatory foods, I might be more, you know, inclined to restrict dairy and eggs for them. Okay. Um, it, in terms of cancer, I think, you know, eggs can be a great protein, but yeah, they're, they're not something we should just eat every single day. Same for dairy. So I tell people to limit it to once a day at the most. Most people have no trouble giving up milk. It's the cheese. Like the cheese. Love cheese. Here's some of the additional insights and pearls of wisdom that just had to be shared on our podcast with Dr. Crystal Zaniga. When we test for vitamin D, only because we've mentioned it so many times, and now I'm just thinking to myself, like, dude, I haven't checked mine in a long time, and I have darker skin, so I'm sure it's low. <laughs> is it is it sufficient to check which which test should we do, or should we do the whole profile to see if we have adequate stores? Given you you know your good point about the the metabolism and and the different kinds of vitamin D you can obtain. Yeah, so typically recommended for um, testing of vitamin D to do 25 hydroxy D. So that is the first step of activation. Um, 125 is when it's fully active and that has a shorter half life. And so it's not really representative of what's kind of available and, and circulating. So 25 hydroxy D, um, I know there's a, not a whole lot of consensus on what is the optimal level. Uh, when I talked about that research related to breast cancer survival, that was showing that less than 20. Um, was associated with more negative outcomes. Uh, So there's sometimes different cutoff points. And then when it comes to supplementation, so we're talking about vitamin D2 and D3 are available. Um, Both will increase vitamin D levels, just D3 might be able to do it faster Um, than others. And always, it's a fat-soluble vitamin. So another tip there is make sure that you're consuming it with a source of fat um, because it's going to need that fat to help with the absorption of it. Is there something you can, you, know, you tell your patients, you know, on how, I guess, statistically X amount of muscle mass preservation leads to Y amount of uh, improved survivorship or outcome? So back to like this idea of these restrictive diets and why I'm careful about them and where we need to watch out with the research is that we also know that up to 20 to 30 percent of cancer related deaths are due to malnutrition. Malnutrition alone. That's right? defined the- by... Um, as defined malnourishment, so cachexia, so losing a significant amount of muscle, you think your heart's a muscle, right? And if someone's malnourished as well, then their um, immune function, their immunocompromised, now prone to infection, something like a common cold, right, could take somebody down yeah. with compromised immune it, function. It, that malnutrition is a clinical 
or is there like the metrics y'all use for like 10% decrease over X amount of time? Um, what would anyone hearing this, like with a loved one might say, well, malnutrition, okay. if that has a worse outcome, what would qualify someone with that, with that label? Sure. So there are actual um, designated criteria for the diagnosis of malnutrition. Um, and so there are several criteria and you only have to meet two in a certain category. Um, but just to understand what criteria are used for diagnosis of malnutrition, where it's like two need to be met is um, low energy intakes. There's different criteria for how long that's been going on to how low it's been and for how long um, the amount of weight loss that happened over what period. Um, then there's a loss of um, functional status. So that's sometimes measured through grip strength, but also looking for edema, sometimes significant edema is a sign of malnutrition. And that's because of the low albumin, I guess. Yes, exactly yeah. right. That that low protein in the blood, then the uh, fluids not being able to come back into circulation. So they have edema. What are some of the tips you give, I guess, in some of the more treatments? And then I guess after that, we can talk about radiation, which that's just obliterating, you know, your taste buds. But what about with the chemotherapy itself? Yeah, yeah. That's one of the tips about using something acidic or marinating um meats and something that's more citrus so that can cut some of those off flavors reminding them to kind of rinse their mouth out because it is part of those platinum agents kind of being excreted and so they're tasting some of that using um, avoiding metallic utensils or eating thing anything like out of a metallic canister that can amplify those bad flavors there is actually a rinse out there that is supposed to help with off metallic flavors uh, that some patients have had some success using. Can you tell me what that is? Uh, sure. Like, I don't know if you want to put it on the podcast or not, but it's called Medicoil. And so you said, you said, um, acidic lemon lime, what, uh, like orange juice and stuff they cut. You said yeah. they cut some of the unpleasant flavors. Yeah. Yeah. Because one of the things is, uh, for example, meat that iron, like there's iron in meat. And so if you're really sensitive to that metallic taste, it's going to taste off going to taste like metal. I've heard patients say metal, garbage, like literal garbage. I've had patients describe food as cardboard or nothing. That it's quite a range. And I said, well, let's find what you can eat and let's work within that. Because okay. it can be very frustrating when you're focusing on all the things that can't eat and don't taste good to you. But what about this? And they're like, oh, well, yeah, that one's fine. And, and th well, that's fine too. It's like, but let's see what we can build with this. And I always like to focus on let's build with what you got, right? And then we can start folding these things in um, to help. But and if you just focus is, on what you can't have, it can really be challenging mentally. Yeah. And the key is that you might find something pleasant that you didn't find pleasant before, like before treatment and cancer. So maybe reinvestigation oh, yeah. or exploration could help. I didn't think, so short of checking other foods and acidic stuff, and then maybe the solution you were mentioning, there's really nothing mm -hmm. else. I, what, no, you said rinsing. So I don't think about that often enough. Like that's just with water. You just rinse, rinse it aggressively. Yeah. Sometimes with water or um, if they're not having mucositis, sometimes a carbonated water can help. A uh, baking soda rinses. Sometimes that doesn't taste good for people, a baking soda salt rinse, uh, but that can also just, or dry mouth is a big thing that people experience. And you think of how your saliva has a major role in how we're tasting foods. So if you have a dry mouth, you're going to have off flavors. There'll also be more bacteria that are able to survive in your mouth because you don't have that bacteria under control. So just keeping the mouth moist may also help. Um, there's things like um, xylem melts or something. They're like xylitol, little tablets that help with stimulating salvation, uh, salivation. So, so those types of tricks. Patients. Like those are the... Yeah, sometimes radiation patients benefit from something like that. Right. But I've seen dry mouth and other therapies too. Just oh, for sure. Wider range of side effects. I think that's probably the most interesting is seeing the range. Like I might expect with someone with this therapy to see these sorts of things, but then you can see quite the gamut within a therapy. Crystal, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I've learned so much. Thank you. Well, Laura, thank you so much yeah. for your insights. Um, it is just, it's always just so almost like needing to scribble everything down with, you know, one, your attention and seriousness, you know, your passion is very felt, but two, you know, your responsible manner of really considering and involving things that I think are widely, honestly, just 
uh, unfairly negligent in the kind of traditional space yeah. that clearly have benefit and outcomes and the day of you know, it doesn't matter what you eat, just like get the calories in. I mean, anyone that says that is just, it's, right. it's living last time. Correct. Absolutely. That's one of the takeaways I put in all my lectures. I said, if you remember nothing else that I told you today, don't tell your patients it doesn't matter what you eat. Yes, please. 